this talk is from, um, so I'm Harriet, I'm from Art Shape, um, which you probably have heard of, maybe not, but we're an access arts charity that um, cover the whole of Gloucestershire. Um, and this is part of a project called Art Bridge of Old, um, which is a professional development course um, for emerging artists. But um, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to John. And we'll have questions at the end. My name's John Adams. I'm an artist. I said when I was six I was going to be an artist, although it hasn't happened for a bit of that time, let's say. Um, I'll explain the title at the end. So that's me, about six. Kind of innocent. Um, Two little boys, this piece is. This was from a piece of work I did in about 2007. Those dreaded plants. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to emphasize something about innocence and not going back. When I was, you know, some of my talk will be about the art and some of my talk will be about me including some you know bits about mental health because you can't have the art without the mental health um, and that was before i had something happen to me at school so life was quite okay i knew i was different i liked collecting things i took an interest in what was around me what was above me and what was below me i think i was born old although i still feel 11. Um, and you can't uninvent the atomic bomb as much as people would like to. There are times in our lives when things happen that alter the trajectory of what we do. And in some respects you can go back and say, I would rather that didn't happen. But maybe the world is a different place because it did. I'm dyslexic as well as autistic. And I found my school pen. And this is my actual school pen from when I was at uh, grammar school. And up till 2004, all I'd done really was draw. And then when I found this pen, I'd always wanted to make something a bit different. Now, I like writing. When I was diagnosed with being dyslexic in... 1999, the first thing I did was start writing poetry because I was told before that that I couldn't. And sometimes what you learn at school stays with you. So writing has always been difficult, but not from an imagination point of view, but from the practical point of view of actually holding a pen and doing it. So the spikes in the pen is about... <coughs> The desire to make work, the desire to write, but the difficulty in holding on to it. So I don't hate writing. I don't hate words. People expect, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about stereotypes and myths. But when you say you're dyslexic, people assume that you hate writing, that you hate books, that you hate poetry, etc. When nothing could be further from the truth. Here's one of my school reports. Again, this is from a piece of work I did in 2008, which was shown at Pallant House Gallery in Chichester. I accidentally got invited there, went there, left some things on display, because that's kind of what my practice was then, sneaking things in places and changing signs and doing that. And they wanted to know who had left this stuff and they got me in after finding out it was me and offered me a show. So and they're very big on outsider artists and I kind of never trained as an artist, so I kind of fit that. This is my art report from school when I was about 16. And at the same time as the MPs were redacting all the stuff they didn't want you to know out of their accounts, etc. I thought I'll redact all the good bits out of my school reports. So I did that digitally, and this is my art school report. Um, 
it wasn't very positive, let's say, because I didn't try at school. When I found out I was dyslexic, I drew this. Because that's how I felt. But it's a very pale, shallow version of how I felt, because it was much more complicated than that. Now, at school, when I was 10, my last year at infant school, I'd been able to mask my dyslexia. Didn't know I was autistic, didn't know I was dyslexic. I just knew I was different. People told me I was stupid because I couldn't write and I couldn't read. But I knew lots of facts. So I could cover everything up until I got into my final year at school. And I had a teacher who, if you know Pink Floyd and have seen the film The Wall, I'm the teacher in that, he was the spitting image in attitude and looks. And he had his classroom arranged very peculiarly, I thought then, but I don't now. All the girls sat in the front that he liked. And then there was a row of people he threw things at. And then there were the people he couldn't be bothered with at the back. I, unfortunately, was in the second row. Mm -hmm. And he looked for weaknesses in kids, like it says in the Pink Floyd song, funny enough. My weakness was spelling, my weakness was writing. So, of course, he exploited that. Now, what I was good at was getting up and talking about stuff and drawing. So, kind of drawing saved me a little bit. And the head came round with his cane behind his back. And he looked at the picture I was drawing and he said, I'd like to put that up on the wall. Now, we're talking 1970, you know, Doctor Who on the telly. And he didn't have pictures on school walls. So I thought, well, this is a chance to prove myself. So he said, when you finished it, and it was a Tudor house, row of, you know, in the street, drew all the bricks in, drew all the tiles in, drew all the wood, no people in it, which I'll explain about later. And I gave it to my teacher. Now, my teacher said, I want you to write on the back what it is and your name. Now, I had a terrible choice because I faced that choice most days because he would come in and find something and I would have to work out ten different ways he would have a go at me and counter those ten different ways. But then he'd come in and do number 11 and I would be completely lost. So he said, right, name, subject, write it on the back and hand it back to me. I had, I had a very simple choice. Either I ask him how to spell Tudor and how to spell Jonathan, because that's why I shortened my name to John, not only because of John Pertwee and Dr. Hall. Um, either I ask him how to do that, and I knew his answer. His answer would be, stupid kid, can't even spell his own name He'll be nothing. So I did my best. Wrote it, handed it in. He held it up in front of the class, then tore it up, put it in the bin. And said, stupid boy, he can't even write his own name. He'll never be anything. And at that point, I started to hide a bit better than I'd hidden before. Um, that is why this picture is like that. Because that one event, and you go through these events through your life, that one event kind of destroys something within your soul. Now I've always drawn. And between the time I left my junior school and senior school, I kept it hidden, which is why my art report was bad. I hadn't even thought I was going to do art. You know, I'd, art got me into trouble. You know, I, I, my art teacher could recognise something in me that I couldn't. Now, like I say, I said I wasn't to be an artist when I was age six. Now, that was because I was having my portrait drawn and someone said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be an artist. 
it wasn't because I was having my portrait done, it was because that's what I felt inside I should be, whatever an artist should be. And although I kept that hidden and I wouldn't draw for anyone because I didn't want to put it publicly on display, my art teacher put me in for my art A, A, o level, A level year early. I think I took it when I took my, um, no, O level a year early. Now, to do that, I missed double maths. My maths teacher wasn't impressed, and I got a detention for taking my art O level a year early. Now, when I failed my maths O level, he blamed it on <coughs> The year, the year later, and all it was was I couldn't remember because I'm dyslexic the formulas that I was supposed to. So, even when you try hard, and I was in a class of three to retake my maths, then I was in a class of one because I failed it again with a D. Then they changed the syllabus and gave you all the formula, and you didn't have to pass all three exams, you could only pass two. And I got an A. Were they pleased? Were they happy? They said I'd mucked them about for two years. Okay, all blamed on my art O level, so I did the A level too, and then I didn't go to art college, I went to do <coughs> rocks and fossils in geology. I trained to become a paleontologist, and that's probably the autistic part of me, systemising, wanting to learn stuff, wanting to do things. And my artwork came in useful, but also my <coughs> lateral thinking my interview, and I'm not really very good with interviews, my interview for university was about three minutes long. Now I was invited into a room and I wore a suit which I'd never done before. I was invited into a room and asked to sit down on a chair that was covered in books. I had to move the chair and the books. Then I couldn't see the bloke who was interviewing me because he had books in the way and he literally did that. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, and I was frightened to death by it, he looked at me and he said, you're from Portsmouth? And I said, yeah. He said, how deep's the Solent? And I said to him, well, it depends where you measure it. <laughs> and he said, you're in. <laughs> that was my interview at the university. It couldn't have been much easier than that. But my drawing came in useful and, you know, the autistic way of thinking. Now this, this I drew again when I found out I was dyslexic, it was for a competition, it was called a letter of the alphabet, and the whole thing's made out of letter A's. Now, who says an autistic person can't see the bigger picture? Because when I left university, um, I went and worked in the Barbican Art Gallery for a year, and I realised that I should be doing the art bit, not the geology bit. I was supposed to go to Canada to do a PhD in sharks, as you do. So I gave it up and I started training through being a studio worker in a print works. And I had various little jobs, most of which it was about drawing. This was quite recent. This was um, a word in mind. So my lateral thinking again decided that I was going to do the M in mind a letter in mind. Um, there's a Dalek hidden in there. When I used to book illustrate, I used to hide things. It's just in front of the entrance and a little bit lower on the ramp up. Um, but yes. So I like drawing. I like drawing. This is probably the only portrait I've ever done. Now I have issues with people. Um, mainly because what are the things that have been done to me? over my life. But as an autistic person, I find looking people in the eyes very difficult. You can learn, you can mask, you can do all sorts of things. I just thought I was odd. So when I finished the, the, the eyes on this picture, I stopped it. I stopped drawing it. I drew this when I was about 23. Yeah, I like sharks. <laughs> I painted this when I was about 19. But eventually I found that I was book illustrating and it took 300 letters, this was in about 1986. I did some work for Shell because as a geologist and an illustrator they didn't have to hire two people, they only had to hire one. 
So I kind of found a niche market, did a lot of science work, did a lot of history and illustration, wrote 300 letters to book publishers, got one reply, and they gave me a job. And I liked working for myself because it meant I didn't have to work with other people. I could be sociable once every two weeks, going to London, and I liked them to tell me exactly what they wanted. You know, written communication leaves most of it out. We want you to draw this. And can I put that in yet? So I had bi-weekly bi meetings with the editor, and I drew pictures like this. That's actually quite small. It's only about that big. This one's about this big. Um, I like people when they're small. And there are things hidden in there. I used to have to sign things that I didn't put anything rude in these pictures that the kids would then find. Um, there's always a little boy chasing a dog. But these were done for Hamlin, and you can sometimes find them in kids' bookshops, in charity shops. Now I drew up till about 2003. Found out I was dyslexic, 2000, 1999, early 2000. Now I was convinced when I went for my dyslexic test that they were just going to tell me I was terminally stupid because that's what I'd been told for 39 years of my life and was reinforced at school. You know, nobody ever told me there was a reason why I couldn't read and write properly. You know, it wasn't a fault in my head. It was just because I had a different way of seeing things. And I have a different memory. Um, I think in pictures, I don't think in words. So I can't actually see letters on a page. You know, when someone talks to me, I see lots of pictures. And a dyslexic person's memory is very bad, short-term memory is very bad. Because we don't learn by rote, and we don't learn... You know, if you told me a phone number, I'd learn, I'd learn the first two numbers and the last one. And it's just a different way our head's set up. You convert those numbers into pictures, and I can reply back to you. You know, so it's just a different way of being set up. Now, I did a fair bit of work for some dyslexia charities, etc. And because I see the world very differently, I've kind of got a bit of an edge on other artists because I can be kind of literal. If I freeze, it's because I have PTSD. Now, that first event at school probably started me down a long line of complex PTSD, which is in the, you know, in the presently being sorted out and you, you'll find that most autistic people have mental health issues. Now it's not because we're weak or it's a fault, it's because society isn't set up to accept us. So one of the darker moments I drew this because this is what it's like in my head. There is a bird in there hidden but it's squashed by the stones. So I don't use my artwork to make me feel better. I use my artwork to get things out and on paper. Now, after drawing other people's pictures for 20 years, and then having a bit of a revelation in about 2006, I now do work for me. I don't do work for other people. One of the first things I did was this. And, you know, I just want to walk into places and take my skin off. You know, because your skin gets damaged, it's an accumulation of all the things that happen to you, although it regenerates. You know, people say you should have a tougher skin, but why don't you stop people having to have tougher skins? You know, it's like stabbing someone in the back and then handing them a stab vest instead of stopping the person stabbing. You. you know, as an autistic person, that's often how I'm treated. It was a uh, space in between. Now that must have been, what, 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago? 12, if you reckon. And it was two pieces I made. One was copper and one was this. This is about reading. It's a chained library. You can't actually undo it and get the books off. Kind of echoes those libraries like you've got in Hereford, where language is power. So, you know, your clergy in the 
15th, 16th century, didn't let people read, but kept everything in Latin, so people didn't get uppity. And that's at Pallant House. And this was the other piece. This is a map of Cornwall, using a piece of sheet of copper, showing the places where the granite comes through. Not Dartmoor though, Dartmoor's over here. And I went to each of the places and took a bit of granite from that place, and then bent the copper around it and cut it out. And the spaces in between the granite is in, in miles, and it's all in braille because I wanted people to touch it. They hung it upside down at Slimbridge, or was it Taunton? Taunted. Well, it, it must be taunted. Yeah, yeah, it was. But I didn't say anything because I like that. I like this. I like little subversive things. I do replace signs. I got very naughty in 2004, 5, 6, and 7. So I would go around covering things up. And it was about the same time I did a residency for a rail company. Oh, this is Arts Council London. I tend to leave things places. So I've got lots of little things that I leave in different places. And this was in the front foyer of Arts Council England in their main offices. Someone actually nicked the whole hat stand. It disappeared. Not because of my labels. But. So I use anything. You know, as an artist, I use anything to express what I do. Anything is fair game. You know, if anybody sees it, that's good. If anybody doesn't see it, that's good too. I went through a phase of writing poems on pieces of paper and sticking them in holes in the wall. Nobody else is going to see that except for me. But that doesn't matter. Now, I worked with a certain rail company to do a residency down in the south of England. I did start with one other rail company, but they decided that they didn't want to do the project and passed me over to another rail company. And the guy was very excited and I did a fair bit with him. And I was artist in resident on their rail network. And the, I, I won an Arts Council prize to do this. It wasn't a grant for the arts, it was a piece of public art because I believe anybody can make art in public you just need to play. There's a lot of snootiness about public art. Well, let's just forget that. You know, if you want to make public art, go and make it. But play, be, be playful. And I put this in the application, want a, want a place to do this. And I went round and I thought, what's the most difficult thing I can do as a person, not as an artist? And that was, you know, you get people who sit on the railway trains and start talking to you. Yeah. That's what I thought was the most difficult thing. I was going to map people's journeys in alternate ways. Now, I did get... Autistic people like patterns. I'm going to bust a few stereotypes, but I'm going to you know, fulfil a few. Yes, we do like patterns, and every time I'm on a station and I look at the patterns of chewing gum, I see constellations. Now, in this style, because this book kept me alive, when I was 11 and 12 and 13 from doing something to myself because of what that teacher said. So I was out in the garden looking at stars. So to remember that, I created lots of patterns from the chewing gum, named them at random by doing, if you go to Wikipedia, you can ask for an article at random, and some of them are great. Um, but when I asked officially if I could take photographs of Brighton Station platform, they said no. So I did it anyway, and disguised it like this. I learned how to, I was a photographer on an aid trip to Romania in 1992, so I knew how to take subversive photographs. A little funny story, you know, you get to ask to do all sorts of odd stuff, because I do all sorts of, use, you know, I do photography, I do video, I do all sorts. I was asked to go and document this aid trip to Romania right at the very beginning. The things I saw have affected me to now. Um, but I had a minder. I didn't know him, but he had jeans on, a black leather jacket and a great big moustache. You know, that stereotype you get of an Eastern European 
minder in the communist times. And he walked behind me about 10 foot. When I stopped, he stopped. When I walked, he walked. Now one day I played a game with him and I lost him. And I very proudly went back to the family who I was staying with, because we stayed with ordinary remaining families. And he was sitting on the settee waiting for me. And then offered to swap a Kalashnikov for a jar of coffee I had. And I politely declined. <laughs> I said the air company wouldn't like me to take it back on the plane. <laughs> this is, I do map things. Um, and that's been a major part of my artwork for the last 10 years. Now this is one day when I went to London. And this was for, like that letter in mind, it was for a postcard auction in London, the Bankside Gallery. Um, and again, this is tiny. But it's my day, everything I noticed on that day. The artwork for the front of this, I actually did with the railway company at London Bridge on a 30 foot high wall. I'm glad I had that picture. Um, and it just says art can be found in the most ordinary of places. So I just took that coat. We had to wear, we had to, we had to do this between three and four in the morning using a lift that was manned by someone else. And we had to wear metal toe cap boots and safety helmets because vinyl was so dangerous. <laughs> Drop that on your toe. <laughs> now, what led to my relationship with the railway company disintegrating was this. Timetables. Yeah, we know about timetables now, emergency timetables, all that sort of stuff. This was the May 2006 2008, sorry, Southern um, Railway Timetable, and it was produced like a book. Now, I got to know quite a few members of staff, and one of them who was leaving, was who I thought, who wrote the timetables, said, when you first did your application to Arts Council, you said you were going to get words in timetables, and I said yes. They've not let you do it, have they? And I said, no, because I'm not allowed to do it. He said, if you tell me what word you want, I'm leaving tomorrow, I'll put it in. <laughs> so I wanted the word dream in the margin, because I've always been a marginalised artist. And it's been my dream, has always been marginalised. 106,000 they printed. <laughs> <laughs> they got complaints. It's a spelling mistake. Now, it wasn't easy to find because it was right in the crease. But, yes, and I got summoned in. But I um, I said I wasn't going to do it anymore before they could tell me I wasn't going to do it anymore. <laughs> but this is the sort of artwork I was making. I just mapped people's journeys. This one wasn't used because it's a... And this one got me my autism diagnosis when I was 53 always part of it, because I mapped all the plastic bags in all the trees between East Croydon and Chichester. <laughs> As you do. I didn't want to talk to anyone that day, and the bags caught my eye. So I systemised them as to what shop they were from, what colour and what condition they were in. Yes. Um, Simon Baron Cohen saw that. Yeah. I did replace some of the notices. There were, a couple, there were a couple of versions of this. There was rain and pain. This might take a little bit of explaining. I was invited to do some artwork in Trafalgar Square. And I had some notices printed up. Because I can't spell. So I can't tell there's anything wrong with this. Because I can't spell. So I, I, I sectioned off the fourth plinth and declared the whole area a non-spelling zone and put lots of notices up and I had lots of people taking... I had some people who were doing some access work and writing things down for people and because they saw the notices, they, you know, and I had... You can do whatever you want with a clipboard and a fluorescent jacket. And they were coming up to me and asking me, um, we need to write things down. Um, can we write them down in Trafalgar Square? And I said, no, you have to do it outside the line. <laughs> yes. 
again, this is about what reading, what other people have imposed on me about my reading, not necessarily the way I think about it, but the way other people have done things to me. Like I said, you could do anything, anything is artwork. I collect stones. Now I have something called synesthesia, um, which I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's cross senses. So I taste music, I hear colour, taste colour. But one of the rarer forms of um, synesthesia is I personify objects. So people all feel the same, mostly, but objects have personality, and that can be electronic objects, but it can also be stones. So I've always collected stones as friends. They're kind of dependable, they don't let you down. And that kind of started off the piece that I did for Art Shape with the stones in. Um, which was the first thing I ever sold actually, because Salisbury bought it. Which was really nice. So I used to collect stones from Cornwall every time, and then we used to go one place every year. And then I used to take them back the next year and put them back. And sometimes when we wrap them in the newspaper, they get words on them. So I kind of thought, thought that was nice. Every time I've gone in the, tur the tent, especially the turbine hall, because of my synesthesia, I've heard seagulls. <laughs> Don't ask me why. But in 2008, I was really lucky to be asked do you want to do anything in the turbine hall? It's empty for a day. Only you can use the back. And it was with a group of other deaf disabled artists too. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to play the sound of seagulls so everybody else can hear what I heard. And I don't like yellow. Yellow tastes in mold. So I, there was a crack. And I loved the crack. In fact, I loved the crack so much I started filling it up with Scrabble letters. Very... Um, wooden horse style down your trouser leg standing over the top of it. Yeah, I told you I was naughty. Um, so when they filled it in, there's a load of Scrabble letters. <laughs> I put the yellow line at the front, even though they said we could only work at the back, and I played the sound of seagulls on the hour for 15 minutes. I wanted beach sound, never mind. So I use stones to make artwork with. I love circles. Circles are, are everything. I'll explain a bit more about that later. And at this particular exhibition, I threw bones in the circle. Nobody would walk in it. We have something very cultural about crossing boundaries and walking into circles. This was a bit of a bigger version, and I had a bit of a tease in the middle, which was a bell that I had made. And the bell was the same size as the core and the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. Nobody would cross that line to ring that bell, except for one Chinese bloke who walked in, walked straight up to the bell, rang it and walked out again. Must be cultural. Now this came in useful because the Olympics people had commissioned me from my Palette House show. You know, life is when you, sh you show in one place and then someone sees it and something completely different happens and something completely different happens out of that. You know, you can't see the future. Some people plan it out. But I like the accidents, and a lot of the work I make is about those accidents. So, a lady saw my show, which was in 2008, and said, would you like to, m to map the cultural Olympiad in the southeast in geological metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> So literally I wrote everything I did down in a geological notebook. It ended up being nearly six years, but it's two million minutes worth of my life. Some of it I chose to draw individual diagrams of. Have you ever heard of... Um, oh, this is my memory freezing. It's an integrated dance, dance company from Surrey. Um, no, it's, um, I'll remember. 
but this was their Olympics work that I went and watched every single performance they did. The last performance they said is, you've been following us around for three years, then you need to play part in the last show. They had at the National Theatre, but only they cancelled it because the lead was ill. Ah. But at the same time as I mapped everything I did in my interaction with the Cultural Olympia, I collected things all the way through. So I made fossils and I collected about 15 to 20 items a day. I have a lot of items. And they weren't, you know, some of it's Olympic memorabilia, but most of it was the ordinary things. And I was really lucky because in 2012, when the Paralympics were on, the work got shown in the Natural History Museum. So there were cases of hair groups with all scientific names underneath <laughs> that I picked up and zoned different places. Actually, I'll go back. My mum died during this, so there are bits and bobs of her that I put in there too. So that mapping of everything I did every day includes my mum dying and me acquiring PTSD. As part of that I was asked to put some pillar wraps in that Royal Festival Hall. There are words hidden in that which I won't tell you. And then this was the final product, which is a geological map of six years of my life. I have to write a memoir down so people understand it. The other thing I did for the Olympics was while I was working on the trains, um, I wanted to, attack, you know, I was looking out the window. Everybody looks out the window or looks down at their feet. Nowadays it's with their phones, because we're talking 10 years ago. And I thought, what can I do? And I started putting stickers in the train carriages, and that lasted three weeks before I was told off. So I came up with the idea of filling certain fields that the trains pass by with cheap flags. How do I make a cheap flag? Get an old book, stick it on a stick, and make a field of flags. The Olympics people took this up again too. It was called Disarticulate and BP sponsored it for one year and then it was used for some of the torch relay and anybody could make flags and put them anywhere in the country people would dance around and make music about it whatever you wanted to and it wasn't necessarily making you know the, the flags in the final place that was the interesting bit it was the conversations you had while making them so there was an artist in resident in a chip shop in Leeds and you know they just made flags and planted them on this one particular day. This was the first time I ever planted flags and I went to the to the butt end of Portsmouth because I wanted to be on my own in this little car park and this van rolled in and all the Portsmouth traffic wardens got out of the van and had their lunch because this was the butt end of Portsmouth and they couldn't be seen, so they helped me plant the flag. <laughs> but I know where the track is. Just one of the examples of where it was shown, mm. and that's in the Olympics Park the year after the Olympics. The noise they made was quite something. That was after about an hour, and we did it for six hours, and filled the place up. But what I really like is the fact that people can do things and be part of an arts project, because when I say come and be part of an arts project, someone will say, I can't draw, so I can't do it. We well, don't need to draw. We just need to be part of it. And I did this project with Arts Catalyst at Cambridge University at the Autism Research Centre, and I made music from MRI machines, and lots of patterns, lots of digital artwork, and I documented the whole thing in poetry. This is one of the, I was late my first day, I saw an interesting pattern on the pavement and photographed 300 yards of it. These are just some of the images I made from that. You know, digital isn't the be all and end all. It's just another tool you can use. It's not, you know, everything and it's not something to be frightened of. And this is what we made. Because as an autistic person, the stereotype is, I, sh I can't see the bigger picture. And I thought, well, I'm going to disprove this, so I made one of these. 
Because not only have you got to know what each bit does, but you've got to know how to wire it up. Otherwise you won't get a sound out of it. So you've got to know the bigger picture. And we did a performance piece in London in 2013. Now because I was working in Cambridge, um, I had my, I got uh, autism diagnosis. Um, which kind of has changed everything in some respects. So there's the MRI machines. If you've ever been in one, you know what an awful noise it makes. But what I can do is it's online, so I can let um, Artshape know the, the address. Now because I'm going to talk for about another 10 minutes, quarter now, and then there's any questions you want. Um, because I documented the entire project in poetry, nearly 40,000 words, if you think a short story is only 10,000 words, it was seen by someone who then invited me to work with him to produce a play on synesthesia and memory. So I had an email. Two days later I find myself sitting in a small Greek restaurant opposite the Young Vic Theatre talking to Peter Brook. So I spent time with Peter, with Mary Helene, and with two of the actors especially, so they knew what it was like living as an autistic person, living as a synesthetic person, and the issues around that, which was all woven in to the final play, which um, premiered back in 2014 in Paris and then came to Britain. And Peter told me that I should write and perform my own plays. So that kind of changed my life because that's something I also do now. When I was a year after I first started writing poetry, I put a poem in for a competition. The then poet laureate was the judge. It was a, a double thing. It was They were going to get artists to draw the poem. So I could have applied to be an artist to draw the poem, which I was used to, but no, I like difficult things, I like challenges, so I wrote the poem for an artist to do, and it got chosen, and went to the opening. There were 20 artists from Britain, 20 from America, and 50 from Japan, I think, because it was an international competition. And we each got introduced to the judges, and Andrew Motion took me to one side and said, never stop writing. Now, to a dyslexic, that meant everything. You know, words can cut you in half, but words can help, you know, heal you too. You don't have to say much to hurt someone, and you don't have to say some, you know, much to lift someone up too. And, and things like this lifted me up too. These are just some of the digital images I made in Paris, because I got to go to Paris to see the, to be part of the, the making process. I do digital portraits. This is John Kelly. You might have heard of him from working with Drake Music. And this was done for Grey Eye 2 for an exhibition in London. I don't do a lot of disability artwork because I don't call myself a disability artist. I'm just an artist. Yes, I could claim to be a disability artist because of my mental health issues, but not because I'm autistic or dyslexic. That's just a different way of being. Now the last project I'm going to talk to you about was came out of the flags. Now you see the person who was commissioned me to do the flags, who was one of the reps for London 2012, we had a very odd set of flag photos sent in. And someone had taken apart an Enid Blyton book in Enid Blyton Drive. Because, yeah, roads are named after people and sent us the photographs. Now this lady remembered this and she left London 2012 and she went on to work for Parliament for the Magna Carta celebrations from t in 2015. And she said, can you do flags but not flags? As in that Enid Blyton, you know, I'm very interested by the names of roads. What can we do with the names of roads that anybody can join in with? Because this was to be their digital engagement project for the whole, for Parliament. And between the two of us, we came up with the idea 
of seeing who the road was named after and whether they had made a difference in any way. Now that includes famous people, it includes not so famous people, and I was interested in the people who stories hadn't been told. You know, the, the most common streets are King and Queen Street, so they're part of democracy. Now the whole point of the project was to also encourage people to vote. You know, to, you know, if you showed that one person can make a difference, then one person's vote can make a difference. I know it's a bit contentious now, democracy, what democracy, but this was a non-sectarian project. It wasn't commissioned by any party, it was commissioned by Parliament itself, and that was a Speaker's Art Fund, which normally commissions portraits. <coughs> so there's a little bit of an irony there. So we did an app, and anybody around the country could look up where they lived and find people around them that may have made a difference, either named after an MP or named after one of 400 people in history. And we worked with the National Portrait Gallery and the, the National Archive um, and a, a, a tiny app company in Portsmouth who were brilliant. And we came up with this. It's called Democracy Street. And anybody could join in in 2015. It's kind of not finished yet. It was finished <coughs> enough to, to finish the project. <coughs> but I haven't finished what I wanted to do because of my PTSD, so I'm working on that now. But we made lots of artwork and we had a final show in the main Westminster Hall in November, I think it was, 2015. And I made lots of maps of connections between streets around the country. This one's a poet and explorer's one. So there's Franklin, Shackleton, um, Nelson, Shakespeare, Tennyson, etc. Because I was looking for patterns. But the app came up with this. So you hit, hit where you were, knew where you were, and it just highlighted streets around you that might be named after someone who's relevant to democracy. So there's John Wesley, maybe Wesley Street. Hunt Street, that's Henry Hunt, not the one we're stuck with now. Um, but King John Street, and there is actually a King John Street. Um, he wasn't that bad, by the way. You learn a lot of history doing these projects. And I would say that because he's my 22nd great grandfather. One of the things we encouraged people to do was to look their family history up and use the details of what they found in the streets to make their own artwork and stories of the area they were in because, you know, knowing your area, like knowing your past, can cement, you know, can cement your future. So I had someone draw up my family history, and it turns out that I'm related to some Magna Carta barons, which is very bizarre, and King Jordan, considering that Parliament chose me to do the Magna Carta celebration. These iron, I like these ironies. But this is some of the artwork I made from that project. These are just the patterns of the streets that people sent in because we asked people to send in what their road was. But they were then made into posters. So you've got Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth II there, because that's Queen Victoria Street in, in London, and that's Queen Elizabeth II, I think it's a street, and the other one is, is Lincoln because that was relevant to, to the Magna Carta. <coughs> and Cecil Road, and each one had a bit of a, a statement made by them too. One of my favourites was Guy Fawkes Street. There is one, it's in Manchester. There is only one. <coughs> he was the last man to enter Parliament with honest intention. <laughs> and these two are my favourite. There's De Montford Street in Leicester, and Wilfred Owen Drive, which is in near Oswestry. Street. Um, which is kind of very relevant to 2018. I've been very lucky at times, even though the PTSD and my mental health issues are quite bad now and they hold me back a bit. It's the only barrier. My barrier isn't because I'm autistic or dyslexic. 
it's because of the way things are the people have imposed on them. But you know, there's nothing wrong with being recognised as being autistic late in life. You know, there's a whole series of us. And the one thing is that we can then press for better changes so the next generations don't have to go through the crap we do. You know, I'm after neurodemocracy, which is access to culture in any form. You know, often autistic people are left out of the arts. You know, neurodivergent culture has been invisible for too long. Now, neurodiversity is the different way in which everybody thinks. And an autistic person isn't neurodiverse. An autistic person is neurodivergent. Because he's not neurotypical. It doesn't fit what everybody considers normal. But what is normal? You know, I'm a disconformist. You know, I reject society's conventional and traditional view of me as an autistic person has been broken I and mean, in a pants to awareness most people are autistic aware they're just aware of what you know we need more understanding because a lot of what's written about autistic people is stereotype and myth this is why I set FLOG up FLOW Observatorium which is the, the country's first equality and diversity neurodivergent organisation we were just going to do it in the arts because the arts doesn't recognise us as a minority yet and that's what we're pressing for you know if you want to see work that's different you commission people who view the world differently but then you have to think differently about how you work with them because all those hurts that I've had over my life and other hurts that autistic people suffer are from people not understanding the way to be with us you know, we... we...